Um, I will uh, call in on a video yeah, on my phone. Maybe that will be better. But while I'm doing that, Hannah can start just to keep things going. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm Hannah. Um, I'm a student and I'm at a health informatics program, just like here. Um, and I tell you about what I'm working on with the clinical medicine um, doing uh, patient movement outcomes or PROs uh, mobile apps using Fire. So, the work started, um, this is a work in progress. Um, it's my, my first time developing an application virus. So I've been having a very interesting time figuring out the resources to use and all that. Um, also, some of the technologies for using are new and I'm working with at um, the So, I'd really love to hear your thoughts on what I'm going to be talking about and your ideas on better, how to make technologies for the problem we're trying to solve and how to design a uh, system that for do that better than what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'd really love to hear it. All right, so, oh, Peter, did you see this message here? It says low system resources may affect your audio quality. Mm. Well, hopefully. Try closing it. some applications. Yeah, well, I can't <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Let me just, hold on, let me maybe. You, you mean there. there. All right, so um, patient reported outcomes or PROs, of course, um, are collected, are often collected using surveys, which is something that CERF does um, quite a bit. Um, patient generated data can also come from other sources, though, for example, um, trackers, like uh, wearable devices, and that kind of stuff. Um, depression and pain tracking questionnaires are examples of screening tools that are. Um, currently used by CERC for things like waiting room, uh, waiting room administration of screening tools for depression and anxiety. And um, what's important about PROs is that they give not only the healthcare provider an opportunity to look into the patient's experience of their health and their healthcare, but it also gives the patient an opportunity to express themselves and through that actually take an active part in their own care. So many PRO systems today are web-based. Um, we're proposing a mobile application here. And um, the reason we want to do this as a mobile application is that smartphones, um, being as ubiquitous as they are today, um, provide us with a host of opportunities to do some exciting, uh, exciting new stuff, like delivering reminders um, through push notification and keeping patients engaged through gamification, stuff like that. Um, but also, mobile apps can integrate with sensors. So smartphones, of course, have some sensors built in, like um, accelerometers, GPS tracking, that kind of stuff. And they also connect to um, other devices, like wearables, um, as I mentioned, that may have additional information for us. Yeah, mine also lets me in. But. Could you guys mute yourself? Oh, sorry. Um, all right, so we set out to develop a mobile application that is uh, adaptable to a number of different health apps or health issues with uh, self-management challenges, where we can uh, take advantage of PROs as well as these other things that um, smartphones enable us to do. CERG has a number of different PRO applications right now, so we hope to be able to extend the new functionality that we're developing back to things that are already being done, as well as some uh, new possible use cases for this kind of application. The other thing that we'd really like to do is develop an application that is cross-platform. So, of course, mobile applications come on Android, iOS, you know, Windows phones, and um, a difficulty with developing these applications is that we really don't want to develop three different pieces of software. We'd rather develop one and deploy it to all the different um, operating systems. So that's a core requirement for us. And finally, we also want to enable the so-called offline first experience um, for the uh, also so-called next billion users. So people 
um, that are only now adopting this kind of technology are often coming from rural areas or even developing countries where there are um, isn't as good of an infrastructure like um, to have continuous connection to the internet. So we want to be able to function even without internet. Um, yeah, and those, so those are the motivate the core motivations for developing this new platform. So the functionality that we'd like to include um, in our application is um, planning treatment activities. So we would like the users to be able to plan um, treatment activities like doing certain exercises or whatever um, the doctor may recommend or what they want to do for themselves, as well as record data about those activities, like whether or not they've done it, for how long they've done it, and so on. Um, that can be captured through questionnaires. Um, but also we can potentially capture it automatically um, through sensors. And then we also want to record symptoms, um, like pain and those kinds of things. Um, and finally, we would really like to visualize trends um, to complete this cycle um, that's described by the stage-based model of personal informatics, first published by Lee et al. in 2010. So these three activities together would ideally form a kind of diary application that individuals can use to manage their health issues and take an active part in their care. So the stage-based model of personal informatics actually um, describes barriers in going from this preparation or planning stage through collection of data, integrating the data with each other in order to then reflect on the data and finally taking action. And some of the barriers that, that are described are going to be, um, we have an opportunity to address them with this mobile application that we're proposing. Um, for example, um, a barrier to collection that was described is remembering to even put in the data and also difficulty entering the data accurately. So we can address that um, with reminders like push notifications um, or Apple Watch notifications. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, and difficulty entering data accurately, of course, would be easily addressed if we can just capture the data automatically um, through an interface with a wearable device or other um, additional piece of hardware. And then there, there are also other barriers on, on different points in this cycle um, that I'm not going to go through for, for time. But yeah, we, there, there are a lot of opportunities here. So some of the health, health issues that we have in mind um, for this application is um, urinary incontinence um, and other women's health issues experienced primarily by postnatal and postmenopausal women. Um, so for that kind of use case, we would have a questionnaire in the app, um, most likely a standardized instrument um, for incontinence uh, and related issues. And then the associated treatment activities that we would schedule through the app and that the user should be able to keep track of for themselves would, for example, be a pelvic floor um, muscle training sessions. And then another example of a use case would be physical therapy. So let's say somebody broke a leg and um, had to be in a hospital bed for a while or bed at home, and um, now I have to relearn how to walk and, and all that. So the doctor might say, you know, do these particular stretches, walk 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day. Um, so a user would then say, yes, I did that, and um, I did it for only 10 minutes today because then I had pain or, or whatever, and then um, filling out the questionnaire um, with regards to their actual outcomes. Yes, Peter? So a quick question. For the treatment activity, are you thinking that the app itself would provide those, um, like provide um, the functionality to walk someone through certain exercises or mindfulness or thought exercises, or are you just suggesting that you link out a user to another service that does those things that maybe you um, validated or something like that? Um, it's an interesting question. So right now we don't envision uh, delivering any of this functionality right. within the app, but um, you know, for things like a uh, mindfulness app that I've written here at the bottom, um, like let's say if you use Headspace or something, um, we could envision having some sort of interface with this app that tells you whether or not you've completed it. Mm -hmm. So basically to actually do the activity, you know, including learning how to do it. 
you go to this other app and then the app reports back right. or it could be a hardware device too that reports back that yes um this has been done at this time um, for the song or um was aborted or you know whatever so of course we want to use fire um for this application and which also will help us uh reuse our application and data model for these different health issues so the resources that i'm using um, right now that I've selected so far are a care plan, a questionnaire, and procedure. And um, so I've looked at, at these resources and uh, decided together with Thurg um, and, and my wonderful team members. Um, uh, by the way, Paul is on the phone, who's my team member, and Ivan also here, um, and Bill, of course. So um, we selected the care plan resource, which seems um a pretty obvious choice and the questionnaire of course and for procedure i'll explain a little bit how we're using that um we're actually not super sure or i'm personally at least not sure about using procedure for this purpose so maybe you guys have a better idea um so here's the care plan resource um the properties i'm using from this resource is the period so we'll have a basically Start and end for this particular care plan. So if you have like a physical therapy um, plan for recovery from your broken leg, it takes, I don't know, four weeks or something, um, then it would have the start and end date in here. And then of course we have the activity array, and I prefer to look at this in JSON format. I hope that it's familiar and <laughs> readable for everyone. But um, so the activity array, um, and within that specifically, we are looking at um, instantiates canonical. So each care plan will basically have activities that refer to this questionnaire that's supposed to be filled out, as well as the treatment activities. So we would have a, um, an activity that's a questionnaire, and that would then have this instantiates canonical um, property. Uh, you can see it actually. I don't know if you can see my mouse, no, you can't. But it says that um, a questionnaire can go in here. And then. Um, it doesn't say the procedure can, right? No. So I was just thinking maybe this is obvious to others, but maybe can you sort of translate what this assertion means, like a canonical plan definition or activity definition? Yeah, um, I have a I have a little graphic that maybe oh, okay. will make it a little bit clearer yeah. in in a couple of slides. Um, so, so to keep in mind, though, um, there will be two different types of activities, at least you know, with the limited scope that I have in mind that we have in mind um, right now. For, yeah. The first one is the questionnaire that has populates this property, and then the second one is the treatment activity, which populates the code, um, which might be something like you know, a line code for. Um, uh, getting up and walking, um, which I'm sure there is one, and then scheduled uh, timing and period. Um, period is, I think, a little bit of a misnomer. If I or timing is a misnomer. I don't know. One of them was confusing to me, but you basically fill out that it's like uh, once every two days or something like that, and then the other field says for 30 minutes or whatever it happens to be. <coughs> So um, to visualize a little bit how I imagine these resources fitting together, um, we have, of course, a patient uh, fire resource and a care plan fire resource. And then we have these um, activities that are part of the, of the care plan resource. And the care plan points to the patient using the subject um, property. And then um, we can, of course, have multiple care plans as well that will all, would all point to the patient. And then the different activities. So, like I mentioned, one of the activities might point to a questionnaire using instantiates canonical, and another activity might point to a certain treatment activity just by code as a codable concept. Um, and then, when it comes to actually representing questionnaires and treatment activities that have been completed, um, the resource that I use. Um, for the completed questionnaire is the questionnaire response, um, which uh, has the properties based on, which points to the care plan. And we have, of course, the questionnaire that it actually answers, subject that it's, uh, the patient it points to, 
um, the time date and time it was completed, and then the actual answer. Of course. Yeah. When when you were looking at these questionnaire resources, did you find any um, actual tools that were using um, the resources and like some uh, already implemented either um, proof of concept or whatever tools that were using these resources um, in that anyway? Like um, builders or something like that. So I did look at the NIH form builder, but there weren't responses in there. Okay. Um, I looked at the examples on the on the HL7 Fire mm -hmm. like, documentation yeah. page, um, and I used those to kind of inform what I should fill out. And mm -hmm. like there was one example care plan for a physical mm -hmm. okay. therapy yeah. okay. that kind of informed a lot of this. Right. Um, yeah. So how does the questionnaire response fit into this uh, diagram here? So um, it points actually to both the patient and the care plan, and what I'm also curious about, um, and maybe you guys have some input on that, is um, it seems redundant that it points to both the patient and the care plan because the care plan points to the patient. So I'm curious if that's just good form or if there's like a practical reason, like maybe to make queries faster or something, I'm not sure. Um, but maybe we can discuss that later. Um, so finally, the procedure. The procedure in my data model is actually uh, representing a completed treatment activity. So for the questionnaire, there is, of course, the questionnaire response, which is the obvious choice for a completed questionnaire. And for the treatment activity, which to me is a little bit more abstract, I guess, I chose the procedure um, because the procedure has things that seem relevant. So it has based on, which um, we can use to refer back to the care plan that it refers to. Then it has this code that I use to define the treatment activity. Um, and it also has performed date and time, and that's really all we need. Um, maybe performed period, um, you know, if the, if the walk was only 21 minutes long instead of 25 or something like that, um, that probably could also be used. So wait, you're trying to model what exactly with the procedure is? So the procedure would be um, a completed uh, instance of this prescribed exercise. Okay. So if your doctor says, um, walk for 30 minutes a day after dinner. Isn't that more like conceptually at least, wouldn't that be more like a medication sort of? Because like you're like, and if it's not modeled well in fire, like, yeah, well, so the reason, again, the reason I chose procedure is because I looked at the physical activity, or sorry, oh, um, physical the, therapy yeah. example, and that used a procedure. Okay. But the thing was, and I discussed this with Bill before, um, that the physical therapy example, I think, was about a patient who goes in to see a physical therapist and they mm -hmm. do a session together. Right, exactly. And so after the session is completed, um, then you go home. It's not like a home thing that you do by yourself. And so then it, it has like this, um, let's see, performer property mm -hmm. down here that would have like a pointer to the, the um, provider record or something like that. Yeah. Or whatever. So what do you guys think? Because I feel like one issue on this using it as a procedure, it really seems like that activity was a medical, like it happened in the medical context. We kind of, you know, I think this is part of, you know, I guess, please back up slightly and say, I think that this whole idea of trying to model real events, um, like, Somebody uses a device, Bluetooth capable device for a, yeah. a period of time, or somebody does shoulder exercises. Yeah. Right. I think that, that that's really interesting because that's actually what we tell people to do yeah. when they go home from the emergency part, or what we send people home with with instructions from their primary care provider. Try these exercises four times a week, mm -hmm. and then you know, like come back in a month and we'll see yeah. how it's gone. So it's kind of fuzzy stuff, and and trying to figure out how to model it, I, I originally thought, oh, procedure must be about billable procedures. Mm -hmm. So it's going to have all of this stuff that's mm -hmm. really irrelevant. And, um, and one thing is, of course, many of these elements aren't required. Right. So, and mm -hmm. then the other thing is that there's this interesting notion of, uh, that Hannah um, brought up, that a performer can be the patient. Right. And so it really is. A nice so, way of describing something that the patient mm -hmm. did for themselves. And I don't know that a procedure has to be, to, to take what you're saying a little bit further, I don't know.
know that a page procedure needs to be prescribed. Yeah. It's kind of interesting that a procedure could be linked back to a care plan, yeah. just as a questionnaire could be linked back to a care plan, because that care plan was the reason that that questionnaire yeah. was generated. Um, but I also kind of think, you know, procedure might turn out to be a good way to keep track of events in a patient's diary, mm -hmm. for instance. And so that's that's a different sort of patient-centered framing, but that's something that we think about also, is um, a patient as part of their diary might take a structured instrument, like a depression screen. But as part of a patient's diary, they might also just write down that they went running. Right. And going running is kind of a procedure. It's something that is patient does, they might even be a person rather than a patient in that context. Right. But the point is the performer is the person who is doing it. Yeah. It has a duration and a, you know. Yeah, it would be useful to share this use case in some way and get some feedback in general because it's a, yeah. Right. And it, it will become more and more. And so it feels like this might be a good instance where the model doesn't seem to break, even though this is probably not what it was designed yeah. for. Right. Mm -hmm. I think to me that's, you know, the compliance of the plan is important. Yeah. That's what we're trying to, seems to me, what we're trying to do is make the patient accountable. Mm -hmm. And said, I went to physical therapy. They told me to do these exercises to come back to work. Well, you know, I'm probably not going to do it. But if I have this compliance thing where I fill out this thing every yeah. day, then, so to me, that's the most, you know, mm -hmm. what I see in mobile lab doing is, is making a, you know, sticking to a plan and reporting back. So that part of it. Yeah, and I mean that's definitely. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I was going to say it's it's in a lot of ways at the core of this idea of patient reported outcomes that they actually report what was actually done, how they actually feel. Um, Rather than us prescribing something and then we'll never know what was done or whether anything was done. And, um, yeah. You brought up the question of why the questionnaire response um, has a based on relationship back to the care plan. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really thought about that before, but I wonder if um, it is, if it, if it may be tied up between the use of the term uh, instantiates canonical. So questionnaires could come from questionnaire um, objects could come from a bunch of different places. And the ones that are, if, it, if you didn't have a link from the response back to care plan, I don't know that have an easy way to figure out that that particular set of responses or that particular procedure was based on a care plan rather yeah. than based on, like I said, maybe a patient diary. For sure, yeah, and so, um... This actually turned out pretty convenient. So I have a I have a screenshot of a prototype here that um, shows this um, treatment plan or like calendar, if you will. So we have the gray icons um, representing planned activities, um, and then the red icons represent activities that were done. So we have a survey that was the check mark being the questionnaire. So a questionnaire was filled out on Wednesday the second. Um, a treatment was done on Tuesday the 1st, and then you can see that the scheduled ones are um, every six days for the questionnaire and every three days for the treatment. So the way I actually populate this right now is um, the user logs in and I get the patient resource because that's linked from the user login and the third-party identity provider database. Um, from there, I go to the care plan. So um, of course, there can be multiple care plans, so I'm looking up the currently active one based on this period property that I showed you guys. And from there, then, I actually no longer care about the patient because I can just look up all the questionnaire responses and procedures that are based on that particular care plan. And so the gray icons here are populated based on the care plan, and then the red icons are populated based on the questionnaire response and oops, um, procedure. Mm -hmm. Um, but so you can see that I never actually used the subject property on the questionnaire response and procedure. Um, do you guys think that's a problem or I, mean, I guess I, it's, I, I mean, it I makes sense general, to. Yeah, fire is not restrictive at all, especially um, 
Yeah. So it would be interesting. Probably would have to figure out like what they were envisioning in their in their use cases that um, that drove the design of the questionnaire response and questionnaire. But yeah, Some subject is required. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. I'm a little bit lost. You've done an excellent job, but how much or what parts of this are occurring in the smartphone? What parts are can require a mainframe, and which parts are communicating with? <laughs> I mean, this is the whole connection system, mm -hmm. but how much of it is inside the little processor? Um, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about that later, actually, but um, all of these parts exist in the smartphone. And this is basically I think, just more of a diagram of kind of the type of data that's being used. Like, right, so the underlying all of these objects for one patient yeah. who exist in one phone, all of these objects for all patients who be mirrored on the surface. So and it's not a big, small kind of thing. <laughs> but so you make a good point though Mike that for different parts of the application functionality we need different parts of this data model right so to like show the calendar for example that I showed a screenshot of we need the care plan the questionnaire response to procedure we don't really need the questionnaire the treatment activity because all we need to know is when they were scheduled when, when Hannah says we need this she means we need to use this type of resource that models this type of data in this way. If, if you were required to think minimalist, 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 how much of it actually has to be in the smartphone app and how much of it could just be in a 75 cent microcontroller that could be put in a band-aid and disposed? In other words, do you put it in the app just because smartphones now are more powerful than computers? That we had 10 years ago, or is it just convenient to do it that way? I, I think well, yeah. I, I mean, it's a complex question. So I think the um, it's not very complex. Actually, this is very minimalistic the way it is. Um, I've designed it so that we only use things that are really needed, and even you know some properties. Um, sorry, I'm taking a picture. Um, but some properties are required, very few of them are required in, in fire resources, um, but some of them are required and I don't end up using them, as we've seen with the subject one, it's required, I don't end up using it, so like, um, you know, there are reasons why it's required, so, you know, you have like a, I assume so you know who, like what patient every piece of data in the server belongs to, like that makes sense to have that. Um, but yeah, it's it's very minimalistic in that way, and we don't actually need like a very powerful computer to process this kind of data because it's so small. We do need a screen because that's a um, an integral part of this um, user application that we're envisioning. So it it couldn't be like a standalone hardware device, for example. Um, but yeah, so so whether or not we load all of the data into the phone or like have it live somewhere else is another thing that I would like to talk about. Um, but first, I'm going to uh, just really quickly give you guys um, an idea of what we're doing to address this cross-platform problem. So we're actually using the Flutter framework um, developed by Google. It's an a application development framework that allows us to write code once and deploy to um, actually uh, uh, iOS, Android, and also web, um, though the web part, I think, is still in beta. Um, there's a lot of libraries that we can use um, just out of the box, so we don't have to write a lot of code from scratch. I mean, we do have to write our own application from scratch, but we don't have to write a lot of the components. Um, and that makes application development very rapid. Um, and finally, another convenient thing um, that the platform provides us with is that the user interface is rebuilt automatically whenever there is a change in the data model. Um, so let's say somebody changes the data about the patient externally, um, and the, uh, the data gets propagated to our application, the application will automatically know to refresh the screen and, and show this up-to-date data. So it might be, it might like change and show you something new as you're using that. Um, 
which can be important for health applications because you don't want to be making decisions based on updated information. Of course, not quite as critical for a user or consumer application as a um, clinical informatics tool, for example, but it's still convenient. Um, Flutter also is actually very similar to React Native, which you may have heard of, um, which is also something we considered. Um, we chose Flutter for not a ton of reasons over React Native. We just had to pick one. Um, it does have some nice things that, that I like about it, but yeah. And then finally, the offline first um, thing that we'd really like to do with this application um, has been an interesting and, and challenging problem for us. So to get back to your question, Mike, um, we actually, the way that we'd like to set it up is we'd actually like to have a copy of the entire database on the phone. Well, not the entire database anyway, so the parts of the database that refer to the particular patient um, that's using this um, application. So we have the, uh, we have the application that's um, represented by the Flutter icon here that's connected to the local instance of a database. Um, and the, the tool we use for that is called Couch. Um, Couchbase, CouchDB uh, are kind of two different versions of this tool. Um, so Couchbase is the one we're using here. Um, and so there's basically an instance of the database on the phone and an instance of the database on the server. And they keep each other in sync automatically. Um, kind of really neat the way this tool does that for us. Um, so we don't have to worry about data being outdated or anything like that. Um, they call it replication. So we replicate part of the actual database onto the device so we don't um, we only ever use local data so all the data is in the phone all the data that is needed um, of course we'd like to make use of an existing fire server like happy um, that comes with a lot of conveniences like querying and that kind of stuff um, so and validating fire resources so the way we envision it right now is we'll have a second database on the server that's a fire uh, dedicated server and then, um, and we're still trying to figure out how to do this, but um, we need to sync all the data from this server uh, side database, uh, couch database, to the actual fire database um, somehow without getting out of sync, um, you know, getting conflicts that can't be resolvable because at that point, we're on the server, there's no user that can help out if there's a conflict, for example, if it says, um, uh, like the, this other data source says that you are supposed to do this exercise for 12 minutes, but this data source says you're supposed to do it for 15 minutes. If you're on the device, you can ask the user, there has been a problem, is it 15 or 12, like theoretically, and then they can say, oh, it's 12 or whatever. Um, but at the point on the, if we only run into this conflict on the server, then we have to figure out how to address these conflicts somehow. So just quickly, in, in this diagram, the way that Fire is integrated, so you have a Flutter app that's running off of the Couchbase uh, data store, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you have that replicated, this is in uh, the server or whatever, or? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then the translation to Fire happens there. Um, no, actually. So the the application uses only Fire resources okay. for so data storage. Fire Jason yeah, object. right. Okay. So even in the, the another thing that's really neat about Couch is that um, it allows just storage of any kind of data blob. Okay. So um, uh, at every point here, we use Fire resources to model mm -hmm. our data. Um, so you could have that Fire logo. <laughs> right. The difficulty is that it's not validated, right? Which the Happy Fire server is something. Something the Happy Fire server does for us. It validates that the resource is correctly formatted. So here it's up to my client code that I wrote as a student um, to make sure that the structure is correct and everything. Well, I, right. I think this also um, shows the different levels you can use. When you say using Fire, there are actually many different levels that you can use Fire in because, first of all, the different um, aspects of the spec, the spec is really helpful in general, which is um, one major use of it. 
and the fact that you can use the Fire API and built up on it all these associated technologies or methods. So I think this illustrates it. Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah, Fire resources might be used throughout, but that does not mean you have a f valid Fire API, which, yeah, I think. Right. Well, this is really sort of this area where, you know, for people who are interested in this from a technical point of view, this is an area where we're pretty interested in getting feedback. Mm -hmm. You could do all kinds of things here. You could put a happy server, phones are pretty powerful. You could put a happy server on the phone and write your own synchronization code between them. You could um, talk to the happy fire server as your primary repository, you could talk to the happy fire server on the server, and then you could just build some fashion to manage when that server wasn't available. Those are really different models, and, and even though Ivan and I are staying close together, we argue briskly about <laughs> which of these approaches we should pursue. But I think this is kind of interesting, this sort of use of fire without using the transport mechanism. Right. And, um, and the other aspect that's interesting, and it will kind of come into the public or global health and public and other um, use cases is that this is pretty generalizable where there are many situations where you need an offline and a healthcare app to work offline, whether it's because you don't have a stable connection or, yeah, I mean, there's a myriad of reasons. And so for that yeah. reason, by the way, it's, it's a little bit mind boggling to us that there doesn't seem to be a solution and, out and there. Which is why I'm, I'm saying like, this is an opportunity, like, Solutions like these come from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and if fire is going to map, this is actually a great um, use case to look at because if fire is supposed to, is going to support the global health use cases, the public health, the additional use cases, this yeah. is an important pattern. I think. Mm -hmm. I always think about that idea of um, and actually, excuse me, I think when you framed it with offline first, right? We always think about offline first as being desirable for the situations where you don't have a reliable connection. Mm. And then we start like looking for places like, oh, I wonder how reliable the cell towers are up in, you know, northeastern Washington State. Turns out they're pretty good. So maybe that's not the problem. But, you know, I think as Hannah and I have talked about this a little bit, another reason to do offline first is because then the responsiveness mm -hmm. is really good mm -hmm. locally, regardless of what your connection is like. Even if you're in in downtown Boston and your cell service drops out for a little bit, right? Okay. So you still have, you always have the consistent responsiveness of the software running on the device that you're on. So I actually think there's all kinds of, you know, and we still have all kinds of problems in the middle of hospitals being able to reliably connect yeah. to their Wi-Fi network. Yeah. And Notion exists from a technical point of view, but they do from an organizational point of view. Mm -hmm. So I think this offline first actually has a bunch of elements that go beyond simply Mm -hmm. sort of I love what, where you're going. I'm curious about the replication. Is that is that something you're going to build, or is that a built-in feature of Couchbase where it maintains sync there? That's one question. Uh, yeah, it's it's actually um, built in with Couchbase. So that's Couchbase's main promise that they have that they um, replicate you know, data between two different servers or a server and a client um, or anything like that and keep it in sync, automatically resolving conflicts and all that. Between engines. So you're using essentially fire mm -hmm. data models that you're using the proprietary um, messaging format. Yes. You're not really using fire. I'm fire, fire uh, resources that correspond to the fire resource definitions, mm -hmm. but yes, it's treated as That's a regular but, data blob. But will the fire resources always be coming in from like some fire server or? Um, well, some of them get created by the application, okay, like a so questionnaire yeah. response would be created by the application, but then, um, you know, a care plan could theoretically come from a doctor, right. doctor's office, like EHR that interfaces with this um, happy fire yeah. server over there, and then it would just. Okay, so we need to, way. I think, move on a bit because we have two more uh, topics that we definitely need to cover and then some more talking about, but this is really exciting. <laughs> so do you want to um, just maybe finish up in the next couple of minutes? Um, yeah, this was actually okay. my last slide. I just had this um, uh, slide of 
thing, specific things that I wanted um, you all's input on, but I think we've gotten some very good feedback already. Yes. Um, well, I think um, the idea of the PRO system um, in theory should enable that to be done pretty easily. So we would only need, um, as I mentioned earlier, we would only need some sort of EHR system or something to pull data from this happy server over here, which um, in theory should be easy because we're using Fire. Um, and so we can just uh, you know, have an interface with an EHR system that automatically pulls this data. So you have, um, I don't know if you use like MyChart or something, you can like um, enable it to sync with your Fitbit account, for example, so it will show how many steps you do every day. We could have something similar where um, um, you can have the EHR sync with our application, so it, up, it automatically uploads whether or not you did the activity and all that. So in terms of messaging or you know, having a custom comment or something. I'm not sure that that would be in scope initially, but there could always be, I mean, you could always set up a questionnaire that has, um, you know, that could be linked from this care plan that says, did everything go all right? Yes, no, um, you know, something like that. And then that would, that could in the theory, um, just be sent over and automatically pop up in the doctor's office, something like that. I think the ethic uses the, Questionnaire response. Epic accepts the questionnaire response object and can understand what those questionnaire responses are and incorporate them in the patient contact record. So, if the Epic system or any other vendor system were connected to that fire server, that there would be a clear pathway to get that kind of data. I think that Epic uses. Um, in order to take a message and send it to a provider, I don't think that they use Fire for that. I think it's a web server API. And so the right place for that, we would probably make a Fire-like message object, drop it into the couch, it would replicate. In fact, it would replicate and trigger an event on the server, and then the server would pick that up and packages the web server to call and send it off. So I think you can kind of, there's like a little bit of business logic missing from the diagram over on the right. And then there's probably a variety of other information sources. Like we'd like to have you know, do everything higher, but the things that we would do by other kinds of interactions, um, we need to, you know, um, actually, we can. Do you have any challenges uh, like migrating the the data from uh, the, the, the um, so we haven't actually done that part yet, but I mean, one reason why we haven't done it yet is because we anticipate it not being trivial. Um, I mean, you can always just, like Bill said, like trigger an event that just copies the data over one, like one to one, but there could be conflicts, you know, um, that kind of stuff where we have to. Um, Kind of consider all the different eventualities. So yeah, we're, we're still thinking about that. Do you think about this architecture? That synchronization function has to happen somewhere. And so we were thinking rather than normally that synchronization happens across the wire, and so it's subject to interrupting communications and all kinds of things like that. And what we're kind of thinking is if we can make use of couches replication, we guarantee that the data arrives in a reliable location, then we have more latitude to sync becomes a local process. Yeah, the, so, the, but it's not a trivial. Yeah, the local couch base and the central couch base will keep trying to connect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we do need to be able to figure out how we're going to treat the same objects for um, non valid objects. Like this, for this architecture to work. It, relies on us 
writing validate valid objects or having a fairly complicated mechanism to send back so to reject an object and then grab it back. Sweet. So do you have any thoughts on how to make that work? Um, I think it would be like so I mean the contents is what you're the documents that you're writing into that space, like from a document oriented perspective, it's very similar to what's going into like the the, you know, the post body of uh, you know the fire rest API request. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like uh, yeah, I mean so I yeah I I mean a nice thing too is that we're not really um, modifying much right like most of these things are like self-contained like separate resources that just need to be saved into the server like the way they are they will not like be edited at least not from this application again um, so that you know might preclude conflicts from happening in the first place but then you know what if like you could change the care plan on the on in the mobile app because you're like I can't like I don't want to do I don't want to walk for 30 minutes every day because I just can't do it yet so I want to change it to 20 minutes and then um, you know it could show 20 minutes in your care plan and then it just says completed every time and so at least you've you've done that and your doctor knows that you changed your actual goal but you still accomplish the goal or something like that so in which case we would then have to uh, you know, manage the edit, make sure that there aren't conflicting edits. But yeah, that may be a French use case. I don't know. Maybe it turns out to be simple. <laughs> well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> so, can you share? I, I know I'm going to um, share um, some of my slide or my presentation. Would you mind sharing it with uh, the Slack channel? When yeah. You get a chance? Um, I can do that. Yeah, and then. Sure. All these conversations you guys can continue on and we'll quickly move on to introducing a cool project. This is like a preview. So thanks everyone yep. for thank you. Well <laughs> oh, no, that was really really excited. I don't know about others, but judging for the facial expressions, they were also excited about that that uh, uh presentation. But um but yeah, so right now we will get a uh quick introduction to a topic that we'll dive into uh, more deeply in on the next meetup in November on the um, opioids project. So uh, Maggie, do you want to introduce in general what's yeah. going on? So yeah. Today we've brought uh, Brian Harris along, who's the Chief Informatics Officer at the Department of Public Health for Washington State. Uh, and he's going to talk about this big fire initiative where a PNC project is about. Okay. So, um, I'm going to you 10, 15, oh, you know. So, um, <laughs> it actually on Zoom is really hard to hear anybody who's not a Right. You can, yeah, you no, can. I don't, sorry. Get to, I don't get to walk you around. You can walk around if you hold this phone with you. Okay. <laughs> I'll look, I'll look at my parents if I walk around. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Um, and where you are, I, it, it's an understatement how excited we are about this. Um, this will be the first fire project for the Department of Health. Um, and um, we were a little embarrassed that we're not the first state in the country to utilize fire. Uh, to combat the opioid crisis. That should have been us, but we will do it better than all the other states. Um, the, uh, what we're, we're hoping to do, and I think um, one of the um, impetuses for this project was the fact that some of those other states did come out with fire activities, but they followed a CDC-based guideline that was a pretty low bar in terms of standard of care. And uh, Pacific Northwest and Washington State is, is, um, has been a leader in this country in terms of um, working on prevention strategies and, and ways to uh, uh, um, uh, work in uh, 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 dealing with the opiate crisis for quite some time and has 
you know, looked at as a leader in, in things like treatment rec recommendations and, and standards of care. So um, we looked at the CDC guidelines that others have based this on and like, well, that doesn't even come close to what our recommendations are. So we needed to right away think about how do we adjust these uh, smart on fire apps that are being distributed as a national model and like, well, that's not gonna work for Washington. That's not good enough. Um, so uh, we put together a um, proposal um, to the uh, to CMS uh, in partnership with our state Medicaid agency. And the proposal included identifying um, uh, two major components, actually three if you, Bill, if you count the one you guys are collaborating on, uh, three major components, um, two major, one shared, let's call it that. Um, but those three components are um, a technical assistance to assist small and medium-sized providers throughout the state of Washington in getting connected with the prescription drug monitoring program. And um, how many people in the room know what the prescription drug monitoring program is? Okay, fabulous, great. The physicians in the room are now required to check it. So I better have raised your hand or we're gonna come after your life. Um, the uh, the prescription drug monitoring program um, has in the last few years has gone through a tremendous increase in its utilization rates. Um, we've we've worked diligently on creating APIs through major vendors like Epic and Cerner to be able to access the prescription drug monitoring program from within the electronic medical record system. But um, and that literally 400 fold increase in the last four years um, to the point where last year was the first time in Washington State's history that there were more queries to the prescription drug monitoring program than opiate prescriptions written, um, which sounds funny when you say it, it always should have been the case. It always, should, people always should have looked at the PDMP before they wrote a prescription. We passed that threshold last, just last year um, because of the work on increasing the ease of access. Um, that's helped the large major providers throughout our state, including the U, uh, UW um, and Kaiser, and um, but left behind are rural, small, and medium-sized provider groups. In many cases, because their EMR provider, EHR provider lacked the customization to query a PDMP using these standard APIs. So our thought was um, for, you know, uh, in addition to the technical assistance part that's happening, let's also have a, an R&D part where we can have the UW CERG team work on creating some type, we're not gonna be prescriptive, some type of fire-based solution, whether it's smart on fire or CDS hooks or whatever mechanism, or maybe it's a couch app, I don't know. I won't uh, uh, direct, but um, we think that there's gonna be some kind of solution needed that could be provided for those providers whose EMR is able to do fire, but there isn't yet a PDMP interface. So you could come in to, um, you know, two years from now when every EHR has to have fire capabilities, you could come in with this solution that's been vetted, tested, um, operated in a location like the UW or some other partner that uh, proves it out. It could then easily be deployed at little or no cost to that provider and allow that access to the, the PDMP, for example. Now, there's a lot of other opportunities that that uh, that resource or set of resources could accomplish. It could look at those modifying those CDC prescribing guides, and it, in addition to querying the PDMP, compare the diagnosis that the patient has with the prescribing guides and offer a recommendation. Um, in Washington State, again, it's going to be more complex than everywhere else. The rest of the country has a set 
guideline. And in Washington State, we have guidelines that are very depending on the practice, the practitioner type. Um, so there's some some complexity and challenges there that we think will need to be overcome. The the third part that I, I mentioned in passing, but it is it is also not trivial, um, is that part of the the catch um, of this funding from CMS is that we have to measure that what we're doing has a beneficial outcome. In order to do that, you have to start measuring something and create a way to track it. And the measure point is they, they realize that an intervention doesn't have an effect instantaneously. So we have to report out what our transition is or what's happened uh, over time three years from now. But we have to accomplish that this year. So one of the other <laughs> One of the other uh, tasks, uh, you know, to the UW is to work together. The technical assistance team and the fire team need to work on creating some type of tableau or other dashboard that, on data that we can start collecting now, leave running for three years so that we can see that um, interventions in these uh, gap provider communities can be have a dent made in them through this through this investment. So we're really um, we know it's ambitious. We know that there's um, lots and lots of work to do. Um, thankfully, there's some preliminary work that was done um, by the UW and formerly Qualys, now Comagine. If you guys are familiar with that group, working as uh, working with provider. Uh, 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 providers throughout the state of Washington. Um, that's informed a lot of what we realize needs to occur. Um, I also see this group and the fire symposium that you hosted last year bringing in folks from Utah who I, I believe they spoke about their opioid um, uh, intervention in um, at uh, University of Utah or Intermountain, I can't remember, both. Um, I think that provided some preliminary work as well. So there's uh, there's a tremendous opportunity for us to 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 have some some huge um, leaps forward this year. You know, Bill, do you want to talk, or Maggie, do you want to talk about uh, other opportunities to disseminate and raise the the capacity of 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 fire throughout? Thank you. Oh, the phone, the phone. I was wondering why Bryant was talking into his wrist. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, well, so Bryant mentioned um, that there's a, a group in the School of Public Health who are working on the kind of technical assistance, scaling the technical assistance activities statewide and um, conducting some evaluation activities along with that. And then um, our scope of work um, has has really kind of fallen out into five pieces, and I'll quickly tell you what we're thinking of doing with those. Um, and but first, I'd say like we're actually very interested in help on any of those five pieces. So um, uh, th there is more than we can do, and there's opportunity to um, to uh, collaborate in in a variety of ways. I'm trying to avoid talking about money, but there's opportunity to collaborate in a variety of ways. Um, so, um, five things that we're tasked with. One of those is um, capacity development, which means that we can support this group. We can expand the activities of this group. Um, last year, we spent a while trying, or a year and a half ago, we spent a while trying to come up with funding for to put on a conference in the fall. We did, that was very successful. We can do that again. I doubt we could organize it sooner than the spring, but we would like to do that. And we don't have a mandate to talk only about opioids, but we certainly would kind of feature some interesting opioid use cases. Capacity development can also include um, buying day-old croissants for this meeting, if anybody's interested for November. Um, the uh, um, So a whole range of activities. 
The second task is interoperability tooling. So we are building tooling or, or we are um, figuring out what tooling we can build that will support accessing data from the PMP um, using Fire. And obviously that means some middle layer as Bryant suggested already that, that our, the, the vendor that Washington State uses doesn't support Fire currently. And um, probably what that middle layer is going to look like is a translation layer into the current standard for querying PMPs, which the Washington State Health, Ex Health Information Exchange already exposes. So that's NCPDP 10.6, which is being replaced with a new NCPDP standard 2017-017 or something like that, or 01, whatever. Yeah, 071, 71, um, this winter, anyway. So, um, so that idea of sort of building layers to expose things as fire is very much within bounds. We want to, the third thing is that we want to use that interoperability tooling to do yet another HIMSS interoperability demonstration. So we've been working now with the IHE organization earlier than we've ever done before and in a bigger role than we've had before in trying to um, uh, shape the, the, um, the HIMSS demonstration around opioids to make sure that we have, our Epic is apparently a partner in it this year, um, NetSmart, a couple of other EMR vendors, um, uh, there's a, a, PD, a PMP vendor that we're waiting to hear from. So it's a kind of a good group of people. And in that setting, the third task we have is to be able to demonstrate some of these interoperability tools. And we're kind of following incrementally on demonstrations that have been done previous years. So it's not completely um, uh, de novo or, or too ambitious. Um, the fourth task is to then identify some early adopters in Washington State and to, to be able to see if we can put some of these tools into practice. And that's a pretty tall order for six months from now, um, but there are some of the smaller healthcare organizations in the state are a bit more nimble than some of the larger ones. Um, and we think that we have some existing relationships based on, on um, proposals to put fire tools in place in some of the uh, competing healthcare organizations to UW that we hope to be able to kind of capitalize on and, and move a little bit quickly. So um, uh, Tom just recently mentioned to me a critical access hospital in the rural part of the state that he thinks is going to would be interested in doing this. Bryant has talked about different county level reporting requirements that may drive some partners to be more interested in reporting some kinds of opioid related events like non-fatal overdoses. So we need to kind of gather up all those pieces and figure out what are some, some real projects we can do this spring? This spring, about the same timing as we hope to put on a nice national conference. So lots of, of nice pieces there. And then the last piece is this idea. Um, uh, Janet Baseman is working on evaluating the state's opioid dashboard and their evaluation and their, their capability to do these ongoing evaluations through that data collection process. I thought that what we might contribute to that is there are some groups within UW, like the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, that have a lot of experience with bringing together much larger chunks of data, but dealing with some of the problems like inconsistent data, sparse data that we would have in this kind of setting as well. So I hope that, that what we'll do on that fifth task is as Janet figures out what that evaluation platform, how the state might improve their current evaluation platform, we might be able to kind of figure out what some of the technical underpinnings to support that might be. So um, five things in reverse order, they are dashboards, real world, pro real world projects, HIMSS interoperability demonstrations, interoperability tooling and capacity development. And we're open to uh, anybody coming forward and saying, what was that fourth one again? Well, I think the, 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 the yes. make it um, from both your excited walk and the general excitement, I think it's pretty obvious why we need this fun day meetup on this. So I think um, we will dedicate the November meetup to this project, talking about the next steps that Bill alluded to and um, and in general, seeing uh, what we can do with all this exciting. Right, and, and a little more concretely than that, um, there are some Fire-based tools already. Bryant mentioned in other states. There's the 
Georgia tool. Their Ken uh, Kaomoto from Utah said that we could use their um, CQL mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. And so what I'd like to do in November is actually, if people are interested in doing a little bit of prep before that, is trying to get some of that stuff running. Mm -hmm. right? And you know, the only one that I actually know where the source code for it is is, is the Utah stuff. But there's a whole bunch of like corresponding with people and finding out if they're really willing to share or, you know, how do we get like an inventory of what's possible to work with? What's actually, what's real rather than, I know that PowerPoint always qualifies as real. I forget <laughs> I said that. It always anyway. Um, yeah. do you, do you, so, so I don't know how to pull that off in November because it's going to be around the time of AMIA. We're all really busy, but as much as possible, I'd like to sort of well, I think there's a lot to do. So whatever we do, we can yeah. take some steps in, in the November one. Um, and then you mentioned CQL. The December meetup um, will likely feature a presentation on CQL by oh. Pascal. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah. we, we could actually use Ken's mm -hmm. software as an example. Yes. And, yeah. No, that's good. So, that if, if it, so these are, again, suggestions. If anyone is, has others for future dates, please like send us uh, on Slack. Um, okay, so since we're coming up um, towards the end of this meetup, um, I will talk a bit about another use case for FIRE that I'm starting up a lot of work on, and I think um, ties into a lot of the um, uh, issues that Bill's work brought up, Hannah's work brought up, but um, is a really interesting uh, example of um, FIRE in uh, the global health setting. So let me bring up my presentation and I will also share it as more of a tutorial um, because I structured it in, in that way um, just so it's a little more easier to reference for either people um, who ha didn't get a chance to uh, see this live or are trying to see it um, later. Okay, so um, just to give you guys an introduction. Um, I currently, uh, I uh, apparently uh, uh, around two weeks ago started a new RA ship at ITEC, which is um, a group that is housed in uh, Harborview in the NJB building there. Um, and I'm working on a project that is attempting to modernize the healthcare system in Haiti. Um, ITEC uh, was. And uh, and actually, I think Bill was in the past involved in some of the programming or some of the code that is still being used that, by that health system. <laughs> but basically, they undertook a project to modernize the infrastructure. And this project um, called Sidish um, resulted in this um, model for uh, interoperability where um, they were trying to go to Haiti um, in the different clinics that were um, using the software and really allow a nationwide sharing of um, health data um, and different services like a shared health record for transfer of care, like reporting um, and many others, basically uh, interoperability layer using the open HIE model. Um, a couple, uh, there were a couple issues with the um, rollout of this model. Um, so the current project is attempting to go in, salvage what worked, um, uh, redesign what didn't work, and basically move the project along in a couple of specific uh, uh, domains or prioritize a couple of specific domains, mainly interoperability between lab systems to collect lab data, um, transfer of care using a sh shared uh, patient record, um, a sort of a master patient index, but mainly uh, focusing on um, connecting to a fingerprinting service to identify patients across uh, the health systems, and a couple others that I won't go into because of um, because of time. So I put a, a lot of links here about these two projects if you're interested in and want to reach out to me afterwards. But basically, um, the the way that this whole health system works is that, um, or the project will work is that there are um, clinical institutions that are using the, the um, 
EMR called eSante. And these institutions are getting upgraded to a new version of this EMR called eSante Plus. eSante Plus is a modified version of the OpenMRS uh, distribution. Um, and OpenMRS, uh, raise your hand if you have heard of it before. Okay, so at least a lot of people. It's, it's a um, open source EMR that's used um, either for research or clinical purposes all across the world, but um, primarily uh, um, it's used across Africa and in Haiti and in a lot of global health situations. Um, OpenMRS has a large developer community. It's a very open developer community. It's a really great um, community to work in. So if you um, want any other introduction, since we don't have much time now, um, definitely check out the guide, which um, let me just quickly show you a picture of, or not a picture of, but basically a live version of. Um, the guide gives you an introduction to the OpenMRS uh, system, its history, um, and some other useful aspects of it are um, the inf OpenMRS information model, which uh, you can go through to see how they model the data. Um, but basically, uh, OpenMRS is being used by the Haiti team uh, for those local instances, EMR instances, and um, this uh, OpenMRS uh, distribution basically has this kind of architecture. OpenMRS itself is a Java application that um, is built using a number of different modules. Um, there's the core OpenMRS module and all of these other bo boxes are modules that you can add on or take away. A distribution of the software includes a package of a, a set package of modules, but you can modify these distributions in the way you like. So it's a very flexible system to meet the very varied needs of um, the, uh, the domain that it's being uh, implemented and developed for and uh, ran in. Um, but at the same time, that uh, has caused a lot of uh, a lot of um, different implementations to go a lot of different ways of their in their customizations and especially on the presentation side so there's uh it, it's a very flexible java application that's being used by many different uh, implementations with various levels of modification but um the the distribution that's being used by isante plus um is a relatively newer one and it does include these modules that I show here, one of which, which you can see is a fire module. So OpenMRS from a project that happened a couple of years ago um, does support, does have some level of fire support um, as a interface to its data model, um, but it also provides a much um, more uh, broad set of its uh, own web services, including a REST API, and then even, I think, broader set of methods that um, that can be directly uh, accessed in the OpenMRS API in the Java application. Um, make sense? Anyone have any? Yep. So the, the, the OpenMRS Fire module I'll go into it a bit because that's actually um, my next uh, part, but they use um, Happy Fire uh, Java, Java modules that um, they import. And, um, and those, the version of those libraries is DSTU3 for Happy Fire, which um, corresponds to STU3 Fire version. Okay, um, this is not really uh, important for now, but there's some links to some of the other modules like the uh, object relational uh, layer and the Spring MDC framework that OpenMRS uses and this really extensive OpenMRS data model that I'm still also trying to understand better. Um, so feel free to uh, hit up those links and then teach me about them. Um, 
but the at the core of my current work is understanding the capabilities of what OpenMRS can do right now. Um, as and all those capabilities are provided by the OpenMRS Fire module, which um, the biggest about which the biggest problem is that the main developers <laughs> don't no longer work on it, and um, it isn't actually being used in production by, from what we know, any in uh, of the OpenMRS instances out there. So um, it's it has testing. It's it has some capabilities, but those capabilities have never been truly validated um, uh, using clinical data in um, in these situations. Uh, I won't go through the architecture too much. You can uh, look through it, and I'll work on this documentation a bit. But basically, the fire module um, takes uh, incoming fire API calls. Um, then it attempts to build, for example, a fire uh, resource, um, you, and the code that uh, that actually maps the fire resource to the OpenMRS data model basically does it by, you know, uh, querying for the OpenMRS data model version of that resource. Let's say the patient resource, um, importing, for example, the the patient uh, class from the Happy Fire uh, library and then creating that patient object um, and then sending that patient object using the Happy Fire, um, another Happy Fire library used for sending the uh, and receiving fire uh, um, calls. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's, it's very much integrated into the module itself. Um, so that's kind of where we are currently. And what we're doing right now, and I want to uh, quickly get your, uh, draw your attention to, is a, oops. Actually, I'll quickly talk about two OpenMRS projects that are either currently ongoing, but pretty new, or just kicking out, up, or just being kicked off. One of them I'm uh, involved with, uh, which is the fire squad that will kind of um, gauge the level of uh, fire support that OpenMRS has now, look at the use cases that exist for the implementations that need uh, further support, and then um, bring and then try to map the gaps that we have in that to uh, the resources that we need to support to the work that needs to be done to uh, at least match the high priority um, use cases that we have to in the short term support using OpenMRS. And then for a more long term plan for this fire squad um, is to uh, take a look at the more long term direction and migrating where OpenMRS has to migrate as a platform um, to perhaps even be fire first in how uh, it operates in order to more easily um, not only encourage development, but also be able to address future needs, especially since it, even though it has a large developer community compared to, you know, some other um, open source projects, the funding uh, patterns and, and the developer uh, capacity always fluctuate and are very hard to coordinate. So um, figuring out a strategy where uh, we can leverage other work that maintains the spec and not have to always play catch up as a software. Um, some of the things that we looked at were, for example, um, Happy Fire or um, the uh, the Hearth uh, Fire server. Both of these, uh, you know, topics I could go into for another like two hours, but I just wanted to. Um, bring them up because this is an ongoing project and there are a couple different directions that we can go in um, that I'll just uh, probably end there for now just to keep you guys interested. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the Isante Hoose. Mm -hmm. Is that a branch? Yes. Of, so of, of OpenMRS mm -hmm. but in 
So, but it's it is actively deployed using a fire module, or is that also still in development? I can show you really quickly. Actually, go into the um, sort uh, to the GitHub project quickly. So, Isante Plus the, um, is a uh, distribution of OpenMRS. So it is uh, production ready. It is being it is running in um, and being rolled out in even more clinics. Um, and the way this uh, distribution works is that the Isante Plus people um, maintain some uh, modules that are specific to that distribution, and then they package the general reference application distribution with some modules with some other modifications to create the Isante Plus distribution. So it's it has. Um, and it is a validated fire resource. It or? it has it has the same version of the fire module running as the other OpenMRS, but that even though it includes that capability, that capability is not being used in production. And and even though multiple um, distributions of OpenMRS have that capability, they are not supporting any actual functionality in production. These guys don't yet because that's where we're trying to. That this is yeah, this is the project where we're trying to, where we're hoping to leverage the fire capability of Usante Plus to allow the data to flow upwards in a variety of ways. But again, it's uh, I have many diagrams and things that because of time I won't be able to go into. But I think we need to. Uh, I think it would be great if people are interested to dig into this a bit more at a future time. Any questions? Oh, great point, because I was about to make that point <laughs> before um, we ended. One of the reasons I'm very excited about the this OpenMRS, the, it, not necessarily the shorthand improvements to the fire module in OpenMRS, because I think from what, what we've seen, those can only be kind of like a band-aid solution to support the most pressing things that we need to support. But a like developing a more long-term strategy to make OpenMRS a um, fire compliant EMR would be hugely beneficial to, um, to provide to the community in general because there is such a lack of a uh, they basically clinic ready system that platform that um, developers making smart on fire uh, applications or developers trying to make CDS hooks uh, solutions or developers working in any space they you you have sandboxes out there that you can test your apps on you can test these apps on the um, the developer platforms of individual uh, EMR vendors like epic or Cerner but there's no good platform that also op um, down the line is an actual clinical use of your app um, that is open source and open um, developer community wise. Right. Either the vendors or some very badly supported sandbox that does not have the level of clinical relevance that you need. I super appreciate the, the, the focus and I know your I, I tip has an international yeah. uh, lens, but there are the public health community here at home can't afford an Epic or a Cerner mm -hmm. install. Um, so there's, I think you're absolutely right in identifying that as a gap for the developers to mm -hmm. test and so there, there's a potential market for the open yeah. source um, groundswell in, in public health and um, and you know, rural rural communities yeah. who are stuck with a vendor yeah. that isn't going to ever be fire ready. Yeah. In order to, to stay compatible with the rest of the world, could end up migrating to something like this. Right. How does it work out for that work that I should have Oh, we get students that look at the job. That's exactly what it means. TKSO in Washington is a support community that serves the next gen for the rural health community. So it's not any of the issues out in the country. Yeah, I, I kind of thought of this from an you know, overall standpoint. You know, it's like people used to find stuff in vendors and all this kind of stuff, and they've been forced into it because they need to do stuff. 
But now we're coming to the posting in for use stuff. These people are like, this stuff doesn't work. So we're going to get stuff that does work. So if you have support and hope you guys have something, a platform that works, these pieces that are muttered, that could be supported reliably you know, by a business that somebody started, I think it's just you know, the opportunities are limitless, really. I hadn't really thought of that. I know that funding is always a challenge for open source in these kind of periods, but that, you know, the, the solutions that people have, kind of like the Red Hat model, would work and can help these things up or not. I think another, another um, niche market that, that is about to start getting in terms of, of not the meaningful use stimulus dollars level, but there's a recognition among the feds that they left the um, behavioral health and mental health community out of universities, not eligible. Um, yeah, and I think there's other And now there, there are grant funding and um, the Partnership and uh, Support Act that so the president of the Mercury Opioid Bill has resources in there to help get the behavioral health community into an electronic health Are we going to steer them towards? One that they won't be able to afford as soon as the one year of stimulus money is over, or do we steer them towards something like this? Um, yeah, there are some behavioral health local folks still in, and uh, Navos are two that are in the Seattle area that Navos yeah, and I just quickly want to bring up um, because there's actually the the fire project is one side of it because it's more like a, trying to move the back end of OpenMRS in a new direction, and the same is currently happening on the front end um, uh, with a project called the Micro Front Ends Project, which is really exciting because um, it, they uh, one of the kind of uh, leaders of the squad is a pretty experienced um, developer from uh, that has worked. I, I feel like in, in this sphere, we're always trying to play catch up in technology acumen and, and the, the the type of, you know, uh, where we are in adopting these technologies. And he's worked in um, these micro front ends like he designed this framework that we're using and is a um is on the team and this uh this project basically is aiming to um replace the um i think java server pages spring uh run uh open MRS front end which you can see here which uh you can um log into um with a, a single page application front end. Um, that, uh, that, and I already logged in, so I don't see the login page, but basically um, that allows different groups to, um, to bring in the solutions that they already created that might have been running on OpenMRS already and 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 because a lot of different implementations had to modernize their front end anyway and created Angular apps or React apps or other sorts of single page apps. Um, so the micro front ends project wanted to kind of standardize that approach, um, allow people to plug in easily these uh, these applications, these standalone Java applications into the OpenMRS uh, front end um, using this idea of a single page application spa where you basically have a list of different applications that you so yeah this is another very interesting project that we could do a whole meetup on. So but if you're uh, I will show um, in the Slack channel channel both the video from this and also um, my write up, Hannah's um, slides and then some information about uh, your guys' project so that we have a Kind of uh, document, including all of this. How do we get into the slideshow? Oh, that's a good question. I feel like the yeah, and then a door opens. Yeah, anyway. <laughs>
<laughs> but uh, I, there should be a link on the on the meetup page. Does that link not work? Has someone? It doesn't work anymore. Okay. Okay, because it works for me. So we need to figure out why Slack is not letting anyone do it. But yeah. Yes. That's what I was going. That that's what I was. I was about to suggest that. Yeah. Okay. We did because it was a little late. Anyway, um, so should we go, you know, yeah. and I'll write my address on the screen very large while we're doing that. So I'm Peter Minkowski. I'm a, a PhD uh, starting my fourth year at uh, UW in biomedical and health medicine, and that's what I'm currently working on. And we heard, yeah. No, we're playing and then you don't need to Well, I'm interested in clinical facing and all that sort of thing. product manager has recently been letting me keep this guy. Okay, Butler, um, uh, the vice president of corporate development for Pure Cloud Corporation, Usher AI. Nagidor, I am also a fourth year PhD student at UW, and I've been working with. I'm Jim Hong. I'm a PhD in 